let's talk about Robert Davis, because that's one of the first cases that you worked on that I was reading. He served 22 years in prison um, mm-hmm. for a crime he didn't commit. Is that right? He served actually about 13 and a half years in prison. 13 and a half, but he was sentenced. Yeah. Sorry, he yeah. was sentenced to 22. He but he yep, still yep. served 13. Yeah. Could you yeah. please tell people about this story? Because it's absolutely insane and how you came to work on this case. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is another one of these these stories that you know I found life changing and that that I'll never forget. Right. So this is 2003 in Virginia, um, in sh- just outside Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where the University of Virginia is, a little town called Crozet. It's February 2003, and um, Robert is 18 years old. He's a high school senior. It's February, so he's only a few months away from graduation. Right from the end of his high school career and like the life and future that awaits after you graduate from high school. It's February, it's a Saturday night, and it's snowing in Crozet, Virginia, right? Robert lives in a little house with his mom on a street called Cling Lane. And on that Saturday night, in the middle of the snowstorm, one of his neighbor's houses goes up in flames, okay? Big fire. The fire department comes, takes them the rest of the night to put out the fire, right? By the morning, though, it's out. And they can go into the house. They go in, they go upstairs, and they find the body of the woman who was the homeowner, Nola Charles. They find her body in a bed, and when they turn her body over, they find a knife in her back. Okay, so suddenly it becomes clear that this fire had been set to cover up her murder. Turns out she's been stabbed and beaten badly. Okay, and then down the road in in another bedroom, they find the body of her toddler son who had died from smoke inhalation, right? From the fire, exactly. So it's a terrible, terrible crime. Rocks, the small town of Crozet. Pretty soon the police have have two actually really great suspects, two, um, two, a brother and sister who lived on another house on that same street, right? Who are the same age as the teenage kids of Nola. She had some teenage kids as well as the the toddler. They were all friends together and they had a history of getting into trouble together. These these neighbor kids in particular, they really struggled with mental illness, right? Untreated mental illness. They had substance abuse problems and this massive history of, you know, violent acts around town. And they really disliked their friend's mom. They really disliked Nola because Nola wouldn't let them all hang out when they wanted to hang out or wear what they wanted to wear, right? That kind of a thing. So they had a grudge against Nola, this brother and sister. Police come in, they, they bring in the brother and sister. They question them. Both of them confess, right? They say, yes, we did this. We broke into the house. We stabbed and beat her, we lit the house on fire. And, and they even, these are, these are good confessions, okay? Because they even lead the police to the snow-covered field where th- there is this iron bar that's been buried in the snow. And that iron bar has Nola's blood on it. It has her DNA on it. So they're able to lead the police to one of the, the weapons used to attack her. Case closed, these are good confessions. Right. And if that's where the story ended, it really wouldn't be that, that you know, a story that I'm, I'm telling here today. But here's the thing. The police thought more than just those two were involved, more than the brother and sister. And they asked them who else is there. And these two rattle off a list of names of kids from their high school that they didn't get along with. Like five or six names. Oh, all these other people were there. too. The police go down that list of names one by one. Turns out each one of these other kids has an alibi except for the last name, which was Robert Davis, right? The 18-year-old who lived on Kling Lane. The police pick up Robert out of the blue at about midnight, uh, not long after this murder happened. They bring him into the interrogation room. He has no idea what's going on. Obviously, no parent, no concerned adult. But the whole thing is caught on videotape. The interrogation that's to come is caught on videotape, about six and a half hours long from about 2 a.m. until about 8 a.m., He's questioned about this awful killing of his neighbor. And they tell him that they have got his, you know, it's one of the most disturbing interrogation videos I've seen, right? It ranks right up there with Brendan. They tell this 18 year old terrified kid, no record, right? At all, total saint of a kid. They tell him that they found his skin cells at the the crime scene, his DNA, which is false, right? That house went up in flames, there's no DNA anywhere. They tell him that they found his DNA at the scene and that he is going to get the death penalty unless he confesses, in which case he'll get, they say, three to five years in prison. And they tell him something else, right? They tell him that they found his DNA and 
they also tell him that they're not allowed to lie to him, even though that's what they just did. I mean, how is any, anyone, right? How can an adult cope with that level of manipulation, let alone an 18 year old, right? I mean, this, yeah, is, yeah. this is just not a fair playing field. And, and after about six hours of this, right, Robert, who's trying to explain that he's innocent, trying, he's begging for a polygraph. Can I prove my innocence? How can I show that I wasn't here? No, we have your DNA. We're not allowed to lie about this. You're going to get the death penalty if you keep this up, right? Keep saying that you're innocent. Eventually, he agrees to confess, at which point, just like Brandon, he gets the story completely wrong. He has them going in the wrong door to the house. He has the murder happening on the first floor rather than in the upstairs bedroom, he says that he um, beat her when in fact that was the other kids, right? They have to tell him, no, 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 Robert, you stabbed her, right? And he's got the wrong people there. The whole story is wrong. And just like they had to tell Brendan how Teresa Hallback was killed, they have to tell Robert what happened to Nola Charles, right? And what happened in that house. And he eventually repeats it back. And based on that confession, he is charged with first degree murder as an adult, he's 18 years old. And the judge, just like in Brendan's case, looked at that whole interrogated, that whole videotaped interrogation and says, there's nothing illegal here. Everything they did was legal. And at that point, you know, Robert's staring at a jury trial in a horrible case where, you know, a mother and her son die that he confessed to. And, you know, instead of taking his chances at trial, he decided to enter a plea of guilty, a false plea of guilty in exchange for a 23 year sentence. This is just a heartbreaker of a case. We got involved many years later um, when a local newspaper published an article about the story, which is how we read about it, just online, right? Yeah, popped yeah, up yeah. in our feed. And um, reached out to Robert, turns out his lawyer who'd, who had uh, you know, represented him at the time, always believed in his innocence. A tremendous lawyer named Steve Rosenfield had stayed in touch with Robert, had pledged to always do whatever he could to prove Robert's innocence. He had received letters recently from the brother and sister who were also convicted, right? Who by that point had spent seven or eight years in prison, realized what they did to Robert and recanted everything they said about what he did, right? They wrote these letters to the lawyer saying, oh my God, now we know that it was wrong to <laughs> falsely implicate him. And we know what prison is like now. And you know, you need to know he had nothing to do with this. We got involved after those letters came forward. We wrote a big analysis of this confession showing why it was false. We got law enforcement authorities involved who also weighed in and said this, this confession is garbage. International authorities, some, some leading experts from the UK weighed in, all kinds of folks. Um, there was even a Dateline NBC episode that was made about it as well to tell the story. And finally, after, after years of putting together this advocacy package and waiting, um, the governor of Virginia, Governor Terry McAuliffe, pardoned Robert Davis on the basis of actual innocence. Um, and Robert got to go home, um, which oh, was one so of the good. Most incredible, yeah. incredible things to, to see and witness, <clears throat> right? But it takes that long and it takes, it really does in every case, it takes an incredible conglomeration of people 